This is the OpenSource.Club, a free St. Louis-focused knowledge share podcast. Through industry experts, entrepreneurs, personal stories, and more, we provide the information you need to achieve and thrive. Always visit our website, theopensource.club, for more details. Contact us on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. I will admit that I know very little about iron workers, but in order to host this podcast, I had to do extensive research that I could at least sound knowledgeable, so... Here it goes. The definition of an iron worker is they build and install iron or steel girders, columns, and other construction materials to form buildings, bridges, and other structures. Iron workers cut, position, and tie down steel bars to reinforce concrete. They repair older infrastructure, make, weld, and cut structural metal in fabricating shops. They erect steel frames. So I guess you could say that an iron worker is literally the glue that holds everything together. I think I'm on the right track now, but to help us understand the job of an iron worker, I have some guests who are going to tell us about the career, available jobs, training programs, and much, much more. I'm your host, Bonita Cornute, and this is a Money Mondays Blue Labor feature in partnership with the Labor Tribune. I'll be back in a minute. As a proud supporter of the men and women who make this country great, Chuck's Boots is proud to offer the largest selection of American-made, union-made work boots in the Midwest. Over 70,000 pairs of boots in stock every day. Stop by today and see why Chuck's is the only place to go for all your work boot needs. Chuck's Boots, located in Fenton and St. Peter's, Missouri. Chuck's Boots, never leave my feet. My guests today are Iron Workers Local 396 Apprentice Coordinator Jim Hunt and his colleague Aurora Beeler. Jim is a fourth generation iron worker. Imagine that, four generations. And his son Brian is also an iron worker. So, all told, five generations of the Hunt family have made this their career. That is phenomenal when you think about it. Jim has worked in all facets of the trade. Some of his biggest projects were the Edward Jones Dome, now known as the Dome at America Center. He was also a part of the teams that built the Page Extension Bridge, the Daniel Boone Bridge, and the new Bush Stadium. Jim worked construction for 29 years. For the past 11 years, he has been an apprentice coordinator for the Iron Workers Local 396. Aurora is a Bachelor of Arts in Fine Sculpture, SIUE graduate. She is originally from Joliet, Illinois, and previously worked for the Illinois State Archaeological Survey as a ceramic analyst. In 2013, she applied and was accepted into the Iron Workers Local 396 Apprentice Program. In 2017, Aurora graduated and is now working as a journeyman. Aurora is an active union member and is the recording secretary for the St. Louis City Labor Club and treasurer for the Missouri Democratic Party Labor Caucus. Wow, <laughs> this is interesting. Jim and Aurora, our guests today. In a moment, you'll hear from them and then we'll really learn what iron workers do and why it's a good occupation. If your saving for retirement strategy involves the phrase, I'll get around to it someday, we need to talk. Hi, I'm Edward Jones Financial Advisor, Stephen Steele. When it comes to meeting your goals, time can be on your side. And there's no better time than now to get started toward your retirement goals. Stop by our office at 6451 Clayton Road or call 314-721-0773. Edward Jones, Making Sense of Investing, member SIPC. Jim and Aurora, welcome to you. It's a pleasure to have you both with us. And Jim, how was my introduction? Did I get the definition right? You did well. You <laughs> I did, did well. well. Okay. <laughs> now that I know uh, that you worked on things like Bush Stadium, give us a picture of what you did on that project. 
Bush Stadium, I actually started out there, went out to unload trucks for the reinforcing for all the footings in the stadium. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the process of doing that, I was asked to stick around and actually be a foreman running the footing gangs. And I was there for all the all the footings almost a year, putting all the footings in. Well, now the footings are what part the of the structure? The footings is, is the, the very base of the structure. That's what every that's what everything sits on. That's that's the starting point of the whole building. Is that like a foundation? It's the like con- it's like the foundation in a house. Okay. You know, it's right, the, all that's underground. You nobody ever sees that. And, and that's so th- what you did. Th- that's what we did. We put all those in. And if Aurora, having graduated college and working as a ceramic analyst, why did you leave that profession to become an iron worker? Uh, I, I knew that the iron workers provided a really, really good wages and benefits. And uh, I wanted to get a start in my life so I could be able to buy a house and and do what I wanted to do. Did you know anybody else who was an iron worker? Did you know anything about the profession? No, I didn't. I knew a little bit, but not much. Not not what I eventually learned what we all do, so. And it seems like such a, a, a drastic change from what you were doing. Um, basically, when, when I was doing archeology, span we were working outside all day, in the summer, hot, eight hours a day, pretty much digging holes deep enough to be, you know, like graves and every single day and we're digging every single day is really, really tough work. So after I was doing that, I realized I could probably tough it out in the trades. And uh, I really like working with my hands. I'm a really tactile person. And so I knew that iron workers uh, did welding and I had done welding from my previous, from doing sculpture. So the combination of being able to work outside and and being able like to weld and do tactile things that's that's the reason why I wanted to become an iron worker. Wow, <laughs> that's truly interesting. Uh, I, I guess I thought they were so different, but it sounds like as you describe it, they're truly related in in many ways. Hard work, hard yeah. work, <laughs> regardless. Hard work. I you like being tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know it truly from your family history, having having this passed along through the generations. I guess your dad, your granddad would come home tired and it still didn't seem like a, a career you wanted to stay away from. I knew what I was getting into when I got it, when I when I went into it. I In high school, my teachers would give me trouble because I wasn't one of them great grade students, you know, but I, I did what I needed to do. And they, they always said, you know, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? And I thought, I'm going to make more money than you. That's what I'm going to do. And and obviously uh, it worked, huh? It worked out. It, it worked out. I started out tying bridge decks for Fred Weber on all the interbelt bridges, Han- Han- Hanley, Scudder, Frost, Airport Road, all those. When all that interbelt was going in, that's what I did the week after I graduated from high school. I started started doing iron work. Wow. Well, um, Jim, give me a, l- a few more details about the apprentice program. How does a person apply? person comes down, applies in person. All you need is a picture ID. Come down between uh, 8 and 2, Monday through Friday. Fill out your application. We take applications all year round. And then we take applications for the, for the class that's coming up from January 16 to January 15 of the following year. So we'll take them until January 15 of 2020 for next year's classes. And then those get sent to everybody that puts an application in gets a letter, and they'll come down for a two-week pre-apprenticeship where they'll go to school for four hours a day for two weeks. You can pick mornings, afternoons, or evenings, whatever whatever time slot accommodates your work or whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. And once you pick that, that's what you got. And they'll come down, we'll work on basic math. We'll do basic, basic math, five different tests on basic math. We'll do a work out an orientation book where it's just, can you just do what you're told to do? You know, because one of the things out in the field that's the scariest is if I tell you to do something, you need to do exactly what I tell you to do. Because if you don't, either I'm gonna, I could get hurt very bad and die, or you could get hurt very bad and die. Mm. So, we want to know that you can do exactly what you're told to do, and that you can just reading comprehension. And then we, one of the fun things that we do is we take them outside every day before when they start class, and we pack iron. We pack rebar. We got what's number 14 rebars, which is 14 eighths of an inch. It was about that big around there. 12 foot long. They weigh about 150 pounds, and they pack those back and forth down the building for the first hour of the day. Pack? What do you... Put them on their shoulders and carry them. They carry them down the other end of the building, set them down. We get them all down there. They pick them up. 
take them back to the other end, set them down, pick them back up, take them back down, and they do that. They do that four times. Stamina building, or just to see if you can tough it out, if you're going to be able to handle it because it hurts. Oh, it hurts your shoulders. Until your shoulders get broke in, you're going to get you're going to get cuts on your shoulders. You're going to get bruised up. And if it's you're going to find out real quick if it's something that you can handle or if you can't handle it. We've had guys drop out just because of that. Okay. You know, it's it's a way to kind of give you a good idea of what you're getting into before you get into the program and, and get out there and realize this isn't for me. Understood. You know, and, and more power to them if they don't. If it's not something they like, then we want them to drop out because we go do something else. You know, you know that's that's fine. Yeah, because this work requires right. This your is undivided what... attention and and skill. Right. That right. makes sense. Well, how long is the program? The program's four years. Four. Four years. They'll go 160 hours a year for four years. Basically, what we do is we break it into four four week classes, four one week classes. So you go to school during the day for 40 hours for one week. You go back out in the field and work for three months. And then you're back in class for a week, and then out in the field, and then back in class again. You know, I kind of like that. Believe it or not, that breaks up the monotony. You're not, you know, stuck on one area of... Uh, it, it works out good. We used to do night classes, and we went to day classes oh, about 11 years ago, and it works out better because when you've worked all day already doing this, and then you come in at night, guys are tired, they want to go home, they want to get a shower, they want to go to bed. Some guys are working 10 hours a day. Yeah. You know, 12 hours a day. This way, we get you fresh 7 o'clock in the morning, just like you were starting work. Mm-hmm. You know, we got your undivided attention. We get a lot more done that way. Are apprentices paid? Is it- apprentices are not paid to go to, sc- to, go to school, okay. but they can collect unemployment. Oh. They can collect unemployment while they're not working. Wow. Well, uh, about that pay, uh, the journeyman makes what? About ninety five thousand dollars a year. That's that's, that's a stretch. A, a average journeyman is going to make between sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year. Oh. Now we do have guys out there making that plus. You know they've that have become superintendents for contractors, general foremen that are working out of town. They realize their value and they they pay them for it. Got it. Well, what are the program certifications? Certifications as far as the school itself, we are accredited with the Department of Labor. And then we all we are also certified through our international. Our international comes down every three years, and cert- and basically we do an IACP certification. Okay. And they come down and they make sure that we're teaching the curriculum that they want us to teach, that we're keeping the records that we want, that we're doing everything like we're like they want us to do, like we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Then from there we have just basic certifications that the guys can get while they're in school. They can get welding certs. We are an AWS accredited. A welding cer- certification place down there. So, our C W we have a CWI. So you, we take do all our weld testing in in house. Hmm. Everything's there. They get post tensioning certifications. They get rigging certifications. They get OSHA ten, OSHA thirty, uh, scaffold certs. A lot of different certifications that they can get while they're down there. Interesting. Well, tell me uh, the prospects for a person who has completed the program. What are job prospects like? Prospects are good, and with ironwork, you get out of it what you put into it. You know, you're not guaranteed anything. If you're a hand, if you're a guy that wants to sit back and watch, you're not going to get much out of it. If you're a guy that gets in there and he and you want to work and you you want to jump in there, you can make you can make a great living at this trade. What do you mean by that? Do you mean that I that I need to speak up when there's a job opening well, or no? What we tell our guys is when you're out in the field and you're working. Mm-hmm. Try to always look ahead. Try to look ahead, see what's the next move. Make the next move before somebody tells you what the next move is. A lot of the stuff we, we do, if you're working on a building, could be repetitious, like what Aurora's doing. It's probably repetitious. She does the same thing every day. So look ahead, automatically move to the next step. Don't wait for somebody to, don't always stand around and wait for somebody to tell you to make the next move. I see. You know, so always be looking ahead. Always always try to work ahead of what's going on. Know what's, know what's coming up before it gets there. How many people are you currently training? 154 right now is what we got in our training program. We're getting ready to take another group in in about about a month. And will it be that same number? No, th- this that that is made up of first year, second years, and third years. Okay. We had a fourth year class that just graduated. We had 38 that just graduated. So we're probably we're looking to take in in the numbers probably somewhere around 50 to 60 guys. I see. Kind of depends on what the work outlook is. 
you know, we our JAC is is combined of labor and management. You know, so we work together and we just we come up with we talk to the management, say how much work do you have coming up? Got it. You know, and then we work that and we come up with a number of apprentices that we think we might need. Interesting. Plus through attrition you're gonna lose guys through the process of the program, through everything else. So Well tell me about the demographics. I'm age uh, race twenty five to thirty five is usually about the age of apprentices that we get. Uh we get very few younger guys. Uh, it used to be we got a lot of older, younger guys. I started out, I was 18. A lot of my class started out, they were 18, 19 years old. It seems like we now it's between 25 and 35 that we get. Okay. Uh, they've gone and tried college and didn't like it and came back and got into trades or went to college, got their degrees, and found out they couldn't get jobs in what they went for, and they're coming back and getting in the iron workers or just getting into trades, you know, period. But... That seems to be the age. It seems to be the best age because they've kind of been around the block a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've they've had a chance to figure out what they want to do. Yes. Well, when you think of the the demographics, uh, we have Aurora here, female. I mean, are you seeing more women and minorities in the profession, or uh, we are, we are seeing more. We are seeing more women. We took, uh, I forget the number for last year, but we took every woman that applied last year. Oh. And we, we get a lot of minority participation. We had uh, 90 or yeah, about 95 minority applicants this year. We, we get a lot of applicants. Do they, you get the applicants, are, but are they in the program? I mean, they are in the, we get, we take 20% minority participation every year. Okay. We, we kind of set a goal for that. We set a goal for 6% women, and we try to keep those goals. We managed to do that now. Does everybody stay? Just apprentices in general. Some guys come, some guys go. But that that's what we shoot for. We're going to stop for a moment and take a break. We'll be right back. Chronic pain, sleep disorders, anxiety, depression, seizures, and more can be relieved with non-toxic, non-addicting, non-psychotropic CBD. Shop for medical-grade and organic edibles, tinctures, capsules, topicals, and pet products. The web address is cbdhealth.today. CBD does not contain THC, and it's legal in all 50 states. CBD is a powerful and healthy cannabis, just like medical marijuana. You don't need a prescription or license to shop online. The web address is cbdhealth.today. Regain your health naturally and safely. The web address is cbdhealth.today. Aurora, let's ask you a couple of questions. How old were you when you entered the program? I was 25. 25. You were in that older group. I am. You weren't that 18-year-old. You came (laughs) in a little later, Mm -hmm. and we know that your profession, your original interest was uh, archaeology. Um, Did your family and friends question what you were doing? Uh, my dad was actually pretty proud. I was a little nervous to tell him. And when I finally told him that I'd, I'd gotten to the iron workers local, he was he was pretty proud of me. So, Why? What did he say? Uh, he he just encouraged me to not put my finger where a spud can go. And uh, huh? <laughs> so, don't, don't fill a hole with a finger. Yeah. That's a, that's a so other than that, fingers. though, uh, yeah, he he was really supportive. Is he in in the profession too? No, no. My dad's a computer programmer. Okay. <laughs> So. Interesting, interesting. And what about your, your your girlfriends, ladies that you went to school with, and your high school friends? I mean, did they think uh, Aurora? What are you doing? Uh, no, I I I kind of um, follow the like. I I kind of go on my own little path usually. So <laughs> I mean, they're, it's not really surprising if I have a new project or you know a new idea. So I mean, all my friends were so they knew that I did sculpture. So. You know, it 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 worked out that in that way, but no, no, everyone was really really encouraging. Tell me, what has this career choice done for you? Um, it's given me uh, a chance to be completely like economically independent. Um, I don't really rely on anybody. Like, I have my own house. I've been able to buy like a new car. Um, I I'm able to go on vacations with my friends. Um. Uh, if I want to take a college class here and there, I can. Uh, it's basically just given me like financial freedom to to do whatever I want to do in a solid middle class lifestyle. Beautiful. Well, what was it like to break into 
what we might think is a traditionally male-dominated. It was really tough at first, but um, I think changing careers no matter what you do is also really tough. You know, I was coming from archaeology and uh, then getting into the trades. It's it's totally, you know, culturally it's different, but at the same time, um, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. Um, I've become really close with people, with guys that I would never normally even talk to. You know, they, they might live out in the sticks somewhere, but, you know, we both watch the same television show and can't <laughs> wait to talk to each other at lunchtime about it. Or, you know, our our favorite movie's the same, and yet, like, we come from two different places of, you know, where we, of life, but yet somehow, you know, we can't wait to, like, talk about Harry Potter at lunch. You know, it's, it's Interesting. just like, things like that. Well, you know what? I, I have to also wonder if at any point, you encountered that male co-worker or superior who treated you differently because you were a woman, tried to give you lighter assignments or heavier assignments to break you. I don't know. What was that like? Did you ever encounter anything like that? Um, That's happened, but the one thing that um, in, in those cases is I'm really persistent and I will not stop. <laughs> so uh, if I have a goal in mind, I will accomplish that goal. And so generally if I'm tested, that kind of uh, dissipates because I'm pretty persistent. And I suppose once they tested you and you passed, you uh, you moved on, and and they moved on. Just obviously. another another guy in the gang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will say most most iron workers on the field, male, female, whatever, all they want you to do is carry your end of the bargain. Mm-hmm. You know, do your job, and obviously, you can't carry as much as I can carry, but as long as I know that you're you're doing your utmost to do your job and and you're not slacking on me guys are fine with it yes. everybody's fine with it. even even with guys and guys if i know, if i can tell that you're not carrying your load and i'm carrying to do more to carry yours then that's when you run into problems once guys realize that hey that guy that guy or that gal or whoever is doing the job to the best she can and she's giving it her all mm-hmm. everything works out fine we try to take care of each other yeah well, you better. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think about it, the work that you do, mm-hmm. it's it could be it, 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 there's life-threatening injury that could potentially occur if someone is not carrying their load. Mm-hmm. One false step, one false move, it could be over for somebody. Interesting. You know, it's it's what it's the nature of the beast. It is what it is, and you know that going in and. One thing you never want to do is you never want to hurt your partner. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you're always looking out for your partner. Mm-hmm. Well, um, uh, how do you go about uh, accepting applications? How often uh, do you accept applications? We accept applications between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. Monday through Friday, and we accept them all year long. You just have to come in with the picture ID. Okay. And you're located where now? We are located at 6301 Knox Industrial Drive. That is right, you know where Hampton and 44 and Hampton and Manchester yes, is? Yes. We're in a little wedge right there, right on the other side of, uh, what's the river there? The, uh, Not River de Pere. Or right on the other side of River de Pere. Okay, okay. Yep. Wow. Well, the information about the Iron Workers Local 396 Apprentice Program is on our website, www.theopensource.club. Before a person applies, what are the basic mandatory skill sets? We don't have a, a mandatory skill set per se, but a person's got to understand that if you're getting in this trade for just the money, you're not going to last. It won't work. Reason being is in the summertime, if it's 90 degrees out of 100 degrees, that iron's 100 degrees. You're going to be packing with it all day. You're going to be carrying it all day. If it's 10 degrees outside, you're going to be carrying 10 degree iron all day. You're going to be frozen when you go home. You're going to be, it's, you got to understand that you're going to have to deal with that day in and day out. When you go home and spend 20 minutes in the shower in the winter try, just trying to thaw your feet and your hands and everything out, you got to know that the next day you're going to go right back and do the same thing. You know, so if you understand that, you're in good shape. You have to be, you have to like working with your hands. You have to love working outdoors. You have to be a good mechanic. Because a lot of the stuff we do is just, you got to be a good mechanic to be able to put it together. You have to uh, understand 
and be able to think outside the box. And what I mean by that is you're going to be given a task to do and you're going to have to figure out the, the quickest and the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to be just, I'll put this piece of paper here and set it down. There may be a bunch of things in your way of doing that and you got to figure out the best way to get that yeah. to get that there. And you have to be able to understand that you are going to be, be pushed outside of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. You're going to get into situations where you're going to have to take a deep breath and go, this goes wrong. This isn't going to be good. And wow. that's all. That's all what makes makes the adrenaline flow for what we do. We love it. But it's gotten safer over the years because we have man lists and stuff that guys work out of, and we have hundred percent tie off what we didn't have before. But you can still fall. You can still get busted up, and you can still get fingers broke and backs hurt and everything else. We're going to stop for a moment and take a break. We'll be right back. As a proud supporter of the men and women who make this country great, Chuck's Boots is proud to offer the largest selection of American-made, union-made work boots in the Midwest. Over 70,000 pairs of boots in stock every day. Stop by today and see why Chuck's is the only place to go for all your work boot needs. Chuck's Boots, located in Fenton and St. Peter's, Missouri. Chuck's Boots, never leave. Well, Aurora, you're sitting there nodding at everything that he's that Jim is saying. Um, so you basically uh, would sign off on the description of the job as he described it, and and what the individual has to bring to the job in terms of stamina and attitude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, you have to be a tactile person. Um, you know, if if you really like working with your hands, the apprenticeship they'll you'll learn what you need to learn in the apprenticeship, but it's just having the heart to be able to do it. You can't teach that, you know? And uh, it's it's a really tough job, but at the same time, I really love it, you know? I, I like that challenge of like, yeah, you know, it is really cold today. And, and I was laughing at like, you know, taking a shower. That's that's what happens. Sometimes when it's 100 degrees out and a million humidity, right? I come home and I just lay down on my hardwood floor in front of the air conditioning bed, you know? <laughs> and it, everyone does it because it's just, it's really tough, but I, I, I really love it. So how would you tell other women that this is the profession for them? I mean... Well, you can't tell anyone that that it's a profession for them. It it really has to be like if you really enjoy working like working really hard physically all the time. You know, like people who are physically active, like women who, you know, if if all you I, I don't know how to explain it, um, you know, if you're really athletic all the time mm-hmm. and all you want to do is sports and, you know, you have to have a job uh, but you really also like adrenaline, <laughs> you're like you're kind of an adrenaline junkie. Uh, but really, it's it's taking pride in building the bones of, of America. Like, that's what it is. I mean, we literally build the bones of everything. Every wow. Every road that you drive on, every bridge that you drive over, every building that you walk into, an iron worker's probably been involved in most of those tasks. And yeah, for women, it's it's really tough sometimes just because we might not have the physical, like the upper body strength, but at the same time, there's ways that you can figure out around it. Like Jim was saying, you have to be creative in how you're doing things. And we just have to be creative in a little different where we, not, we might not be able to lift something a certain way, but I can still get it done because I'll think of another way to get it up there regardless. It's, yeah. it's exciting. It, it, one of the things too is, there's nothing like driving by a building, driving over a bridge, and telling your family that, that you worked on that bridge, mm-hmm. or you worked on this, or your dad worked on that, or your grandpa did this. Mm. You know, my grandkids, when we drive over stuff now, their dad worked on that, or grandpa worked on that. They know. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's a neat feeling. Uh, along with the union benefits, with, our, with a good pension, wages, health insurance, our local is, all, is actually, if I'm not mistaken, one of the only locals now that has maternity leave for... Our, in the it's trades. through our international. Yes, through we're our international. the uh, the iron workers are the first building trades to have a paid maternity leave, which is six months pre delivery. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, now, I gee whiz, I would have thought I never <laughs> thought that there would not be that available for any trade. Um, 
union. But you're saying just iron workers offer that? Yep. Yep, right now at this point. That's interesting. Thank you so much for joining us today. When I started this show, I said I knew very little about iron workers, but this has been truly interesting for me, and um, I'm learning that it is a career that pays extremely well with union benefits. It's even more attractive. Um, it's just something to think about because we know that living middle-class lifestyle is really hard these days. So I say thank you to both of you. This has been a Blue Labor feature in partnership with the Labor Tribune. I am your host, Bonita Cornute. Thank you for listening to the OpenSource.club podcast. Become a subscriber through RSS or YouTube. There's more to come that you won't want to miss. Our name is our web address, theopensource.club. <laughs>